From the newsrooms of the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, this is Please Explain. I'm Samantha Selinger Morris. It's Monday, September 25. For months, our newspapers have been laying out the operational failures in the Federal Department of Home Affairs. The department, which is responsible for immigration, national security, and border control, has been accused of not doing enough to stop human traffickers from entering the country and was robustly criticized for the operation of offshore detention centers. Now, an exclusive investigation conducted by The Age, The City Morning Herald, and 60 Minutes can reveal allegations that the man who heads up the Department of Home Affairs tried to use back channels to shape governments and build his own political empire. Today, investigative journalist Nick McKenzie on Michael Pizzullo and how power and influence really work in the halls of Parliament House in Canberra. So, Nick, our mastheads have already uncovered a number of failures within the Department of Home Affairs. But with your latest story, it centres around these messages that were sent between Michael Pizzullo and someone called Scott Briggs. But before we get into those text messages, can you tell us what exactly is this story about and who are the men at the centre of it? Well, what we see is this campaign of influence or interference in the political machinations of the Liberal Party involving Michael Buzzullo on the one hand and Scott Briggs on the other. Michael Pizzullo is a fixture in Canberra. He's been a public servant for a very long time, but he really rose to great power and influence after becoming the Secretary first of the Department of Immigration and Border Protection, and then of this mega new department, the Department of Home Affairs, our key national security department. In 2017, he helped create the department, and then he was appointed to lead it as Secretary. And Scott Briggs, who is he? Well, he's the other key player in this extraordinary story. Scott Briggs is a very influential backroom Liberal Party man. So he's a political operative. Uh, He's held positions within the party. uh, And and through his involvement in the Liberal Party in New South Wales especially, he became a personal confidant of two Prime Ministers, Malcolm Turnbull and then Scott Morrison. So he's a classic backroom man involved in, in party political matters. And so for a period of time when Turnbull was Prime Minister and Morrison was Prime Minister, you can imagine Scott Briggs wielded a huge amount of power, backroom political power. Now one thing must be said, this is Scott Briggs's bread and butter. He is a political operative. He is there to wheel and deal behind the scenes. Uh, everybody knows that. And that's, uh, if you'd like, his job as an unelected political backroom man. That's, that's what he does. He's now a lobbyist. He's a businessman. It's not Michael Buzzullo's job to do that as a public servant. Public servants under the APS, the Australian Public Service Code of Conduct, under the rules of of the game, are not allowed to be political. They must be apolitical. And according to Michael Buzzullo himself, they must not be involved in raw politics. Right. But according to your latest reporting, you found that at times that's what Michael Pizzullo appears to have been doing. He's been seeking to influence politics, which, as you say, as a public servant, he's not supposed to be doing. So how did you discover that? Well, we've been scrutinising the Home Affairs Department for many, many months now. And as part of that investigation, looking at lots of different things, uh, I got word of there being messages sent via encrypted apps by Mr. Pizzullo that might show serious politicking. And I sought to find those messages. And ultimately, I found a, a third party who is known to the players in this scandal, has had dealings with both Mr. Briggs and Mr. Pizzullo and others, and who had access and had cited and knowledge of the content of these messages. And I'll leave it there. From there, we I need to protect my sources, but from there, we confirmed their existence, uncovered their content, and corroborated their genuineness, and uh, reported them to the public as we should. Okay, so tell us about those messages then. What did they say, and what can we glean from them? Well, think here, if our listeners have watched House of Cards or even... Game of Thrones. It's a it's a battle for power. What did what power did Pizzullo want? Power is a lot like real estate. It's all about location, location, location. The closer you are to the source, the higher your property value. He wanted to be a very, very powerful public servant. He already was that, but wanted to be even more powerful. Two things on his mind. Does he become the Secretary of the Department of Defence or the Secretary of the Uh, a Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, very, very powerful public servant roles. What the messages show is that's what he was trying to do. He was trying to use Scott Briggs' influence in the 
Liberal Party, and especially with two Prime Ministers, Turnbull and Morrison, to advance Bazzullo's interests. Bazzullo's personal interests, his policy interests. Let me give an example. Bazzullo was trying to get Briggs to feed in, this is the language used, can you feed it, I'll feed this in, or feed it in to the Prime Minister of the day about who should occupy a a key cabinet position, for instance, or who was a crappy politician, who should go in the Liberal Party, who should be removed, who was blocking Pizzullo's uh, policy uh, interests. We have messages where Pizzullo is is championing the removal of the then Attorney General George Brandis and undermining George Brandis repeatedly because Pizzullo felt Brandis was standing in the way of one of Pizzullo's key aims to build this Department of Home Affairs, which he would go on to lead. So what did Pizzullo do? As these ministers were blocking him, he was undermining and denigrating them behind the scenes, egging Briggs on, and it looks very much like egging Briggs on to make sure that the Prime Minister of the day, in this case Turnbull, knew that these politicians were no good, were blocking this great plan, had to be stopped, had to be moved, had to be pushed out of the way. There's a, a great series of messages, great because they give this huge insight into this political gamesmanship, where Pizzullo posts a message on an encrypted application to Briggs announcing that Brandis is finally resigning from politics to take up a diplomatic position. There's a lot of speculation about the Attorney General George Brandis. Will he stay in the Cabinet or will he go? Government and Briggs r- responds, have I ever let you down? George Brandis will be appointed the next High Commissioner to the UK. That the reshuffle... And the response of Pizzullo to that message is an applause emoji. So he's he's cheering on this departure of this politician, the the Attorney General of the day, uh, whose crime seems to be in Pizzullo's mind that he was blocking Pizzullo's plan to build this mega new department. Okay, and one of the elements of your story that I found really interesting was the series of messages that appeared to show Mike Pizzullo pushing really hard for a, quote, right winger to be installed as the head of the Home Affairs Department. At the time, Peter Dutton, Scott Morrison and Malcolm Turnbull were all jostling to become Prime Minister. Tell us about those messages. It perhaps goes to the heart of this story. So there's this tremendous political battle in the Liberal Party. The Liberal Party is at war. There's a three-man contest. You've got, in fact, there's a number of contenders in the mix. You know, Turnbull's under pressure. He's the Prime Minister of the day. Uh, There's a challenge from Peter Dutton, then Home Affairs Minister. We've got Scott Morrison then uh, coming into the fray. Julie Bishop, lots of speculation as to whether she could take over the Prime Ministership. That's political business playing out. It's nasty and ugly, but that's politics. Unfortunately, we've seen too much of it in Australia. But behind the scenes, Pizzullo is sending these messages to Briggs, knowing that Briggs is a confidant of Turnbull and Morrison. His preference is for right-wingers to take over or hold the position of Minister for Home Affairs. Uh, He describes how he'd he'd preferred uh, Peter Dutton or Scott Morrison to take over that portfolio uh, or to retain that portfolio. Or he mentions a couple of other key names as to who he thinks must go. And he's got no, there's no place for him to be suggesting who takes over a cabinet position. At the same time, he's derisive or, or, or mocking of Julie Bishop as she emerges as a potential candidate, uh, describing his almost having a heart attack when it looked like she was a, a contender. Again, no place for him to be saying this to Briggs. Uh, so trying to use Briggs to shape what the cabinet looks like and expressing his pleasure or displeasure as these political machinations are unfolding. By his own estimate, by his own words, Bazillo said publicly, A public servant must be distant, must not be involved in royal politics. What is important for the public servant is is that one must absent oneself from any partisan discussions and avoid exposure to raw politics, especially as it might relate to... This was his involvement in the rawest form of politics possible. Who should get what role and why they were good for the role or not. Secretaries of departments have a particular obligation to protect the boundary between the political and the administrative especially in relation to the law as it relates to... The- OK, so do you think it's fair to say then that Mike Pazzullo's efforts to influence who took charge of the Home Affairs portfolio worked? Did he successfully influence politics? It's hard to know because the person or people who were trying to influence were principally Malcolm Turnbull and Scott Morrison. Now, I'm sure they would say, well, I'm the Prime Minister of the day, I'm not going to be listening to Scott Briggs whispering in my ear. But what's important is what we can see from this evidence, and that is an attempt to influence, an attempt to be involved in politics, and a disregard for the real need to be apolitical as a public servant. 
We can't have our public servants. The whole system of oversight and accountability breaks down in our system of government if unelected officials, if public servants are wheeling and dealing behind the scenes in a political manner. And the reason that's a problem is if you want to get involved in politics, you must open yourself up to public scrutiny and ultimately to scrutiny at the ballot box. Uh, The public, if they don't like what you're up to, they can vote you out. A public servant doesn't have that ballot box accountability. That's why they can't be wielding or seeking to wield political influence. And if they seek to do it, again, they need to take off the public servant hat and get into the political ring openly where they can be held to account. Once you become a political player, once you seek to shape the movement or actions, decision-making of an elected government in a way that's political, uh, advising them on who should hold a certain role, how to sidestep scrutiny from the opposition, uh, then you enter the political fray in a way which is troubling because it involves a lack of accountability, because that's when abuses of power occur, and that's when democracy falls apart. I mean, democracy involves politicians who can be voted in or out. There's that check and balance of the the ballot box. Once a public servant is seeking to exercise political power, we can't vote him in or out. He's he's in some respects above the law, above the people in in that respect, and that's why this story is so serious. Nick, Mike Pazullo's text messages also reveal him ridiculing Senate estimates and advocating for media silencing, even at one point boasting of his efforts to make press freedom, quote, a dead duck. Can you tell us about these messages? That's right. More extraordinary messages. Now, what he was doing was twofold in respect to the issues you've raised. Number one, he was using Scott Briggs to try to lobby for a new regime to allow the government to shut down the media or to prevent publication of stories that the government of the day felt were not in the national interest in terms of national security. These things are called denotices. So if, if Pazillo had his way, it was pushing Briggs to influence the Prime Minister to support this, the government could issue a denotice that would block a newspaper publishing something which perhaps it felt was in the public interest. The other thing he was discussing with Briggs is you know, Senate estimates is a critical way where public servants like Pizzullo are held to account. It's the way that our parliament makes sure the public servants are being apolitical, are acting uh, in accordance with their duties and, and aren't overstepping any political boundaries. He was derisive, Pizzullo, of uh, Senate estimates in the process uh, to Scott Briggs, and he seemed to suggest that he would use his position in Senate estimates to influence certain outcomes for political benefit or to promote his own uh, policy views, and also simply dismissive of the, of the process being a process of accountability. Uh, public servants should be respectful of Senate estimates because this is the place where they are held to account. There are checks and balances in place. Uh, but Pizzullo's messages suggest he was anything but. And Nick, I wanted to take a step back here and talk about Mike Pizzullo. What do you think was driving him? It's very clear, I think, from his messages that he's a man uh, intent on on his own ambitions, realising his own ambitions. He wants to control more and more of the national security framework. And he, he doesn't like politicians getting in his way. Uh, so as politicians sought to put checks and balances or to interrupt Pizzullo's grand vision for a new Department of Home Affairs which would make him uber-powerful as a public servant. He didn't like that, so he sought to undermine them and push them out of the way. Uh, uh, what's that all about? He wanted the top jobs. He wanted his policy vision realised. He wanted politicians who he didn't like out of positions of influence. And do you think that some of this comes down to Michael Pizzullo's own political beliefs, that perhaps this was him barracking for the more conservative side of politics that he appears to support? Well, what we see is this pushing for conservative, or in his words, right-wingers politicians in the coalition to take over national security posts, uh, because his vision of the way that national security uh, must be maintained is to involve a hardline right-winger approach. And if that was his view, uh, it, 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 because it's so, it's so close to becoming a political view, who should hold this political post? One, as a public servant, must be very, very careful how they express it. Now, if you feel like it's appropriate to express it as a public servant, then perhaps you do so to your minister. But do you reach behind the back corner 
go to the back channel of a political operative in the form of Scott Briggs and seek to influence the Prime Minister of the day through that back channel as to who should hold that post. That's where the political boundaries are absolutely leapt over in, in my mind. And I don't think uh, many, many long-time observers of politics would think otherwise. And Nick, finally, is it possible at this point for Michael Pizzullo to keep his job? What's going to happen to him now? I mean, ultimately, the question of whether Mr Pizzullo should keep his job is one that can only really be resolved by two people. Uh, the Minister of the Day, Home Affairs Minister Claire O'Neill, and, and ultimately she's part of a, a government and, and cabinet and it would consult with our Prime Minister on that question, and, and Mr Bazzullo himself. And to answer that question, I think both Mr Bazzullo and the Minister of the Day need to ask, were his actions so grossly political also non-apolitical, was he in breach of the uh, the Australian Public Service code of conduct and values requiring him to be apolitical? And if he was in breach, how grossly in breach? Now, I think the messages speak for themselves. Then if we if we agree on that, if that's what they believe, if Mr Bozzolo believes that upon reflection or the Minister of the Day believes that, then if that trust has been burned, if that breach has occurred, uh, can he or should he keep his job? And that's a question above my pay grade. Uh, but I think it's a, it's, it's a really a matter of how gross the breach and is that breach big enough to lead to a betrayal of trust where he can no longer hold that very, very important position. Thank you, Nick, for joining us. Thanks for your time. Today's episode of Please Explain was produced by Tammy Mills. Our executive producer is Ruby Schwartz. Please Explain is a production of The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. If you enjoy the show and want more of our journalism, subscribe to our newspapers today. It's the best way to support what we do. Search The Age or smh.com.au forward slash subscribe. I'm Samantha Selinger-Morris. This is Please Explain. Thanks for listening. <laughs>